Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, today, well, it's a very important day. It's a very, uh, we are privileged to have today uh, Miss Marie Arana. We, we are really, uh, I guess, grateful for this opportunity, right? I'm pretty sure this will be a very enriching opportunity for all of us, especially for our students. Uh, I would like to say hello to uh, Chibote and Mitos. Okay, to our Arabic students over there too as well. Uh, well, let me start by welcoming this awesome panel. Uh, we have the great pleasure to be accompanied by Ms. Elizabeth Palacios, our academic project coordinator. Uh, Ms. Pilar Sotelo, our manager of our international exam department. Hello. Uh, Mr. Victor Castillo, Lima Senator Administrator. You already know them. Uh, Mr. Paul Castillo, our representative as well. <laughs> Mr. Hakim Hazam, U.S. Embassy representative. Thank you for being here with us. We also have here uh, Ms. Daniela Flores, our academic researcher, is also accompanied. Okay. Uh, and of course, our uh, star here, which is Ms. Mariana. Uh, Ms. Let me share with you some information about Ms. Marie Arana. Uh, she's a Peruvian American author of nonfiction and fiction, senior advisor to the U.S. Librarian of Congress, director of the National Book Festival. The John W. Kluge Center's Chair of the Cultures of the Countries of the South, and writer at the large of the, I'm oh sorry, a uh, writer at large of the Washington Post. For many years, she was editor in chief of the Washington Post literary section, Book World. She has also written for the New York Times, the National Geographic, the International Herald Tribune, the El País de España, the Comercio de Peru as well, among many other publications. Her biography of Simone Bolivar won the 2014 Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Her memoir, American Chica, was a uh, finalist for the National Book Award. She has also written two novels, uh, Shell Fame and Lima Nights. Um, right? Okay. So, without further ado, I would like to pass it over to Ms. Mariana, who will start showing some questions. Okay, please let me know what it is. Well, because as, as we all know, 
intercultural marriages uh, present challenges. My father, uh, Jorge Arana Cisneros, who was, of course, uh, uh, a Peruvian of many, many generations, uh, when wartime came, this was the Second World War, and the uh, American universities were virtually emptied out of males. All the males were sent off to war. And the universities began to give um, scholarships to uh, uh, students from allied countries. And of course, a very devoted, loyal country to the United States at the time was Peru. And uh, the State Department offered my father, the United States State Department offered my father who at that point had graduated from the School of Engineers here in Lima, offered him a scholarship to go study in the United States. He was, I would say, he was probably about 23 years old, and uh, he went off to study in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. And uh, he basically did his master's in Boston at MIT. And it was at MIT that he had uh, the chance to meet my mother, who was a North American and uh, had been for generations a North American from who had been born in Kansas and grew up on the West Coast and happened to be in Boston studying music. She was a, a violinist and she was studying music in the conservatory. The conservatory of music was right next to the uh, university, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And so, during wartime, they were combining the student populations to come and eat in the same cafeteria. And that's when my father met my mother, they fell in love, and then he brought her down to, to Lima. Um, and she began this uh, sort of amazing journey of acculturating to a country and a family uh, of course, we all know, I know this from my group and background, group and families are very, very strong. And, um, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, cultural differences between families in the United States and, and, and in Peru are, are, very, are very marked. And my mother was, at that point, uh, acculturating uh, and trying to learn Spanish and trying to learn how you were a good wife and a good mother and a good daughter-in-law to um, my, my father's parents. So there was a whole system of, of, of learning, really, the whole culture. Um, in time, because then, of course, my, my older sister was born, my brother was born, uh, and then I was born, and uh, nine years later, we were off to live in the United States, and then it was my father who had the job of acculturating and um, learning a completely new language and culture. Of course, he, he, you know, he thought he knew English when he left uh, uh, his elementary school and his, and his, the, his, his school of engineers. When he got to MIT, um, his English was definitely not good enough to understand uh, the, what the professors were saying. And he had a lot of trouble actually. Uh, learning English and, and, and mastering it to the point that he could actually work in it and live in it. So when he came to live in the United States when I was 10 years old, he was the one who was, uh, who, who was having to adapt to a new country. So I became, in the process, a first role witness of a marriage that was uh, really struggling not only to to, uh, to, to get accustomed to one another as a partner for life, but to get accustomed to the, con to the countries that we lived in, to the ways that you, you raise children. And believe me, there are so many differences in the way that we as Peruvians or we as Americans in the United States um, do a million things. You, you, uh, you have different customs, you have different ways of you eat differently, you pray differently, you, 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 know, you have children, you raise your children differently, you are educated differently. Um, you have, it's, it's, it, we all have, of course, human uh, commonalities. 
but there are cultural differences, and those differences need to be learned. Uh, I, when I went on to study in uh, school and in university, and then postgraduate school, um, it never occurred to me, really, um, that I needed to pay attention to my group and background. Uh, I was just plowing ahead, doing the uh, North American thing of trying to do a career. Um, and I chose, as a habit, uh, a career in books and in writing and in journalism. Which was an extraordinary a career, but nobody in the process of this career, nobody asked me once, you know, you're Peruvian. So, you know, what does that mean? And will you be doing some projects that involve Peru or, you know, Latin America or something? Nobody once in uh, the uh, two publishing houses that I worked in in New York and uh, in the process of uh, teaching, which I had done before that, nobody had asked me uh, anything about my Peruvian background until I reached the Washington Post. And I went from being a book editor uh, in New York City uh, at two publishing houses to become the literary editor of the Washington Post, which meant uh, dealing with books uh, across the board, you know, the whole spectrum of books. And you know, when I got to the Post, and I remember it was the very first day the, my boss said to me, um, I see here that you were born in Lima, Lima, Peru, and I said, yes. And he said, well, that means that you speak Spanish. And I said, well, yes. Um, and he said, well, yeah, you're a literary editor, we hired you to do that, but I think that it would be really good for you to um, be a kind of bridge for us uh, with the uh, Hispanic community in Washington, D.C., because it's growing. This was in 1991. And in fact, you know, when, when I had arrived at the age of 10 in New Jersey, uh, the only Peruvians uh, or Latin Americans that I saw were my brother, my sister, and my father. Um, and suddenly, in the course of my lifetime of growing up and becoming an adult, there had been such a process of immigration in the United States that it had gone from maybe 9 or 10 percent to a full 25 percent of the population of the United States is Hispanic, is, uh, is, is Latino. So um, it became important, and it, and it, didn't, uh, it didn't occur to me because I had been working so hard in the in the American uh, the career path that Latin America and Peru and my background may actually be useful to a newspaper in the United States. So um, that was an eye-opener. And it was at that point that I began to think about who was, who was that little girl that I had left behind in Lima at the age of nine to go to the United States to, to suddenly put on a completely new identity and try to, you know, acculturate myself to a new place and a new kind of um, a, 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 a new personality, a new, a new language, a new everything. And who was that little girl that I left behind? And uh, I wrote five pages. I just sat down. And I, I've been, you know, an editor and helping other people to write, so I just sat down and wrote five pages about my childhood. And I looked at it, and um, I said about that by that point I had a lot of friends in publishing because I had worked in the publishing industry for so long. I sent it off to a friend of mine who was an agent, and she immediately wrote back and she said, this is, this is the beginning of the book. Um, this is the beginning of the book. And I have even, it, it was so intimate, uh, those, those five pages, it was so personal, the story, that of course it wasn't journalism. It wasn't anything that a newspaper would publish necessarily. It was the beginning of a memoir, and that was the beginning of American Chica, which was uh, it. Now it's just been published in a Peruvian edition, and I'm so grateful for it because it's, it was published in English, of course. It's been published in translations around the world. It's even been published in Spanish before, but in the United States. But this is a new translation, and it is. Um, uh, a Peruvian edition, a totally Peruvian edition, and I'm very grateful to the um, editorial uh, Animal de Invierno, 
which is published this year. And I'm very grateful to the American Embassy, thank you very much, for um, providing this book for all of you to have an experience to, to read um, a little bit about the experience of this one life and its, um, and its sort of bridge work, if you can call it that, uh, from Peru to the United States. Uh, I have to say that you know, in, in writing it, even in the course of writing it, um, I think the cultural differences became very acute to me because um, in uh, writing the sort of things that, it, it, that first of all, number one, uh, a memoir in the United States is a very conventional form of book. Uh, it is a huge uh, genre and a very popular genre in, in the U.S. In Peru, not so much. You, if you have autobiographies, there are autobiographies by Viva Mario Agaciosa or uh, somebody of great station who has a whole life to tell. Uh, not a lot of, uh, in fact, I can't uh, think of very many um, memoirs of uh, small human stories. There are very, very many of them. United States. So right there, I was entering, you know, a very large cultural difference. I was, I was talking about my own personal experience, my family, a lot of secrets, by the way, um, and a lot of uh, family secrets, which in, in in the American sense, in the North American sense, I talk about them uh, because you know people want to know what was that marriage like, how, what were the difficulties, what were the um, the challenges, what went on intimately within your family, uh, and what was the history, uh, both of, you know, on your father's side and on your mother's side. Completely conventional story in the American sense. In the Peruvian sense, not so much. And I never forgot um, when I actually finished writing it, and I wrote it in a fury. I wrote it in the course of six, six months. Um, and I finished the manuscript, and I gave one copy to my mother and one copy to my father, even though they were under the same roof, living in the same house, I gave them two copies so that they could go off and read them separately. My mother called me the next morning. She read it completely of that night, and she called me the next morning. She said, well, it's not my life, but it's your life, and you've done a very nice job. Um, it's great. And my father, Peruvian side, Peruvian reaction, wouldn't talk to me for months. He was appalled. He was appalled by the, um, the, the, the telling the personal family stories, talking about um, the difficulties that my mother had with her mother-in-law, his mother, uh, talking about just the, 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 um, and the difficulties that he had in accommodating himself to, to the U.S. So even though as I was writing it, I was talking to them all along the way and asking them, what do you remember? Tell me what you remember. And they were telling me you know, separately, and my aunts and uncles were all telling me these stories. It didn't really hit my father until he saw it on the page that this was you know, an intimate story that he was sharing with me and that he knew that I was writing a book, but he didn't really feel it until he was reading it on the page. So there was a tremendous cultural um, difference in the, in the acceptance of the art form. And uh, eventually, you know, we had to come to terms with that. Eventually, there came a day, three months afterwards, because I was, I was thinking that I was never going to be able to publish this book. Um, I, I uh, was calling my parents about seven days, and talking to my mother, and she said, well, no, he, won't. he doesn't want to talk to you. He's very upset. This went on for three months. After three months, my mother called me and she said, your father is now ready to see you. So I went to their house, and I'll never forget this, because I was, I was, you know, that my mother opened the door and I could see right from the house to the dining room table where my father was sitting. And he immediately stood up and put his hands up in the air and he said, we are not going to talk about your book. We are not going to talk about the memory, we are not going to talk about whatever you want to do with it, do it, it's your life. 
you're my daughter, I love you, and that's the end of the story. Well, I went on and I published the book. It won some prizes. It got a lot of very good reviews. Then my father said, oh, he started to quote from the book. So I could see that he had accepted at that point uh, the book. But the, you know, the whole process uh, I'm trying to, to uh, communicate is that it, in life itself, in family relations, in the act of writing, in the act of remembering, in the act of setting down for, for the future, um, there are such cultural differences that, that become very, very important, I think, uh, in the process of uh, negotiating between worlds. And I've always seen uh, my parents as people who have actually lived with this uh, work of, of creating bridges between cultures. And I, as a person who has constantly lived on that bridge, I'm someone who never really feels, especially now that I have started with, with American Chica, I have now done five books after American Chica that all have to do with Latin America. And my whole uh, process, my whole, I think, um, my, my whole objective, goal, and challenge is to try to explain a little bit about the culture and the history of Latin Americans and Peruvians, but Latin Americans in general, to an English-speaking public. Um, and that has been I've devoted the rest of my career. Once this started, once this book started, it sort of opened a whole new area, and that's, and that's what I'm trying to do. Um, it's, it's good work. It is very rewarding work. I'm uh, very grateful to to people who do this work every day. I mean, the American uh, the American Embassy, ICNA. I mean, these are people who are doing bridge work every day, and I uh, feel that I am a colleague and uh, a, someone who who works in the same fields as as uh, people who do uh, uh, diplomacy or general just communications or translation or publishing I mean, the whole business of getting people to understand what is at the other side of a divide and uh, in, in my last book which was a biography of Simon Bolivar I was trying to find a story that would explain to English speaking uh, readers to English language readers a story that would explain how different all the history in Latin America is from the history in North America. The colonial experience and the revolutions, the wars for independence in this region were created a very different population, a different way of thinking. Uh, the, American the American Revolution with uh, Washington and Jefferson and John Adams and all of those uh, great heroes is very, very different from the uh, revolution that was that, that came down here with Sigo Bolivar and, and San Martin. And, um, it is a very different uh, colonial structure, a very different mentality, a very different war. And uh, I think these are the things that shape us, history, culture, language, uh, all of these things need to be explained sometimes so that people can understand who we are, why we think the way that we do, and, um, and why, uh, you know, when you are dealing with human relationships and with uh, relationships between countries, these things become acutely important. And it's important for people to understand and for people to, um, to, to try to get a grasp of uh, so that they, we, we know what we're talking about. We know that when, when we, uh, we, we talk about the cultural politics of the country, it's coming from a long history uh, that is very, very different from the history of Europe, from the history of the United States. And um, the more that we understand that background, the more that we understand each other. So um, that is... Uh, my story that is uh, the work that I've been, I've been doing with, uh, in, in my literary efforts. I also had the opportunity, and this is what we're, I'm, I'm going to share with you now, I, always, I also had the opportunity in um, the last couple of years 
to um, work with a, an American uh, movie director, and his name is Richard Robbins, and who uh, uh, is a very good, uh, is quite a wonderful documentary uh, film producer, director and producer. And he was, uh, he called me, uh, I guess it was about, about 2012, he called me and he said, I've read American Chica and I like it a lot. Um, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm doing a documentary of young girls around the world and why it is that education for girls between the age of 13 and 17 is so important. Um, and there is a, a very strong evidence proven in social science that if you can capture girls between the age of 13 and 17 and educate them and uh, raise them up in, uh, in, in terms of uh, just in terms of schooling, that you can change the whole fabric of a community and you can change the, the, the um, oh, health improves, uh, the infant mortality goes down, incidence of AIDS goes down, the, the potability of water goes up. Uh, the community changes entirely if you can focus on educating. This is a proven apparently in social science throughout the world. So he said, I'm trying to document this in a film and going around the world and I read your story because it's about girls. And he said, I'm calling you because I just don't think Peru is poor enough for the evidence that I'm looking for here. I want to find a really poor community. I said, you don't think Peru is poor enough for Peru? So certainly we've come great, Peru has come great bounds. Uh, fantastic progress in the past years. But you can find poor communities in Peru. And so he said, well, find me one. And so at that point, um, you started looking at the, the outer circle of Lima, started looking in, in the uh, jungle, started looking also in the Sierra. We went to uh, a place called La Rinconada, which is on the border, very close to the border with Bolivia, Peru and Bolivia. It's a mining community. It's a very high mountain. It's called the uh, Ananea. And it's a community that is, lives at 17. It's the highest human habitation in the world. And it's there that uh, gold mining is done. A lot of it informal, illegal gold mining. And um, it went there and found a, uh, a population of children who were going to try to go to school there in a very poor community, also um, completely unpoliced uh, uh, community, very, very difficult place to live. And um, I was sent, the, 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 the advanced crew went up to get um, videos of maybe 20, 30 girls that we could focus on. And I was looking through the videos, I was sitting here in Lima looking through the videos, and one of the videos was a little girl who was 14 at the time. She had lost her father. She was going, slowly going to London because of mercury poisoning. Her uh, brother had been injured in a mining incident. Um, she was talking about this in, uh, as the video was, was recording her. And what she kept doing at every turn when she was asked a question about her mother or her father, she was she would answer by reciting the poetry of Cesar Vallejo. And I was just, you know, I played this again and again. The, the crew didn't realize that she was using the words of Cesar Vallejo. Um, but I, you know, she was so obvious. Um, and so I played it again and again, and I realized this is the girl. This is my girl. This is the girl who, uh, who in as poor and as difficult a situation as she is in on this mountain, loves poetry and has memorized poetry, and not only has memorized poetry, but has internalized it to the point where she is giving it back as an answer to everything she has lived. Well, 
uh, that was the girl, and that was the girl that I chose. And so I wrote this portion of the film, Girl Rising, which takes place all around the world, focused on this one Peruvian girl who represents all of Latin America for this documentary, which has since gone on to be shown everywhere, really, around the world. And so I'd like to show you this segment, um, if you'll bear with me, from uh, Girl Rising and this wonderful little girl who is now, well, that was when she was 14, she's now 17 years old and um, is going to university in Juliaca. So, um, podemos poner la película, por favor? 